Welcome to USA Global TV and Radio, where our mission is to provide education, entertainment, hope, and inspiration. USA Global TV and Radio connects you with experts and audiences all around the world every single day to help you succeed in business and to live a richer life. Visit us at usaglobaltv.com to learn about career and life-changing training and mentoring programs like The Listening Mentor. Subscribe to our newsletter to stay informed about our special programs and offers. Discover how you can become a guest on one of our shows or a host or producer of a USA Global TV and radio show of your very own. That's USA Global TV and radio, where the doctor is always in. Hello and welcome to USA Global TV and Radio. I am Tracy Cram Perkins and our show today is Dementia Home Care. I invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, USA Global TV and Radio. I am a four-time dementia caregiving survivor and the author of Dementia Home Care, How to Prepare Before, During and After. And unfortunately, our guest is running late today, but I'd like to introduce him anyway. Uh, Joining me today will be Dr. Les Griffith. Uh, Les is a physician, author, lecturer, and public speaker who has been involved in educating students and the public for over 40 years. He is the co-founder of Bastyr University, the Harvard of science-based natural medicine, where he holds the position of Professor Emeritus. He has spent the last 10 years exploring and researching the role of mitochondria and what it plays in the generation of inflammation that activates microphages and microglia in aging and degenerative disorders, and how an age-related deficiency of alpha-ketoglutarate, also known as AKG, can cripple the stem cell's ability to repair and heal or rebuild injured, old, or dysfunctioning cells. He is currently researching how CBDs anti-inflammatory and oxidant mechanisms play a role in disease prevention. Anyway, since we are waiting for him at the moment, I'm going to take this opportunity and talk a little bit about my book because we haven't talked about it in quite some time. For those of you not aware, I am a four times, I said, dementia home care, dementia care survivor. I wrote this book as a I wrote this book as in order to keep a promise to my father, who asked me, what does it take to be treated like a human being? And so I'd like to read you the first chapter quickly and then talk about some of the features in the book and share some stories with you. So first of all, and oh, I do want to mention this, because I am a fellow caregiver and I cared for four family members, I want you to know that this has, and let me see if I can do this in the screen here, a four-page table of content that you can run your finger down the page to find the challenge of the day because I know how difficult it is to find answers when you are stressed. So let's get started first of all with the introduction here. We all look for quick answers and shortcuts, especially when we're under great stress. This book is for anyone who is struggling to care for someone with dementia. It contains what can I try in this moment tips you can use, whether you're caring for a family member or a friend. Everyone's journey is different. The road will change every aspect of your life and theirs. Dementia is like playing hide and seek. Ready or not, here I come. None of us saw dementia barreling down the hill at us like a Mack truck with no brakes because it slowly arrived with plausible explanations for everything. Only when we look back do we see the mounting evidence. No two people experience dementia the same way. No two family members will care for a loved one with dementia the same way. Caring for someone with dementia is one of the most stressful burdens a person can ever accept. We have more training to drive a car operate a smartphone, or boil water than we do to care for someone who is saying the long goodbye. Unlike a day job with dementia care, there are no vacations, no pay raises, and no glowing performance reviews. And unlike child care, there is no first day of kindergarten, no graduation, no 
My journey started when my younger sister called me to tell me our father reached his tipping point and didn't have the health to continue caring for our mother. When, what I didn't know at the time was my father already traveled down the road of Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is a great mimic, disguising itself as anything else, even from the person who has the disease. I didn't discover he had it for several more years. I wasn't a caregiver. I didn't know the first thing about caregiving. I didn't have any medical training. I did know I needed help and lots of it. The caregiver, that's you and me. You may think you're not a caregiver, but you're a person who is, you think of a caregiver as someone who is working at a skilled care facility who is trained and gets paid. Nope, we fall into the category. We tend to think of ourselves as wives. Husbands, life partners, daughters, sons, friends, or extended family. You are a caregiver. Even if you are 3,000 miles away and managing as much as humanly possible over the phone, you are still a caregiver. We are America's largest health care provider, the unpaid family caregiver. And because of that, I started out on a journey with my family trying to figure out how to do dementia care. And I failed 75% of the time. And I now look at that as learning 75% of the ways not to take care of somebody. And I put in the 25% of the time things that worked because I wanted to make sure there was something here as a toolbox. I used this toolbox because I couldn't find things that I was looking for in other books. My dad would melt down in front of me. I would remember I I would remember I read about it in a book somewhere. I would run off to grab the book to figure out how to solve the problem, and I could not find it. He would still be melting down, and I'm going, what am I going to do? And I started saving it all in one spot. Eventually, I got good enough to figure out well, I was the one causing the triggers, but I did not understand that. And for the first year and a half, I lost a lot of the relationship with my father because I kept trying to reality to, to to bring him back to my reality when he couldn't cross that bridge anymore. You might not be aware of it, but with brain diseases, especially Alzheimer's disease, the brain develops holes. Uh, and so the, your skull starts filling with fluid so that it protects the brain material. But what's happening is that Im information that was in that hole, that space that's now gone is no longer there. And so what I was doing with my dad, is I would argue with him trying to get him back to where I was because that was my emotional need, not his. When I finally figured out that that wasn't the way to work with him and I could actually get into his shoes and walk him through to a place of safety, then we were able to get along so much better and my stress levels decreased massively. So let me give you an example. We had one day where we had to go to a doctor's appointment and it was the middle of winter. I pulled out his favorite coat and we had exactly 20 minutes to get to the doctor's appointment, which meant I had 15 minutes of driving time and five minutes to get parked and into the building. My dad came out, saw me holding the coat and screamed, it's poison. And he ripped it out of my hand and threw it on the floor and started panting really heavily that we were going to die for, and yelled, we're going to die from poison gas. In that moment, I panicked thinking, oh my God, how am I going to get him to a doctor's appointment? The next thing that I thought of was, okay, this isn't going to work, but please God, let me go with this. I grabbed gloves out of the bathroom and I had my dad inch along the wall and get in front of the broom closet. And while he was standing there, I said, okay, I've got my gloves on. I'm protected. We're going to get this into the closet. Dad, can you please open the door for me so I can, and I'm going to throw the coat in there and then we'll close it. We'll be protected. So he's standing there. He's panicking. He's hyperventilating. His skin is turning white and red and he's starting to sweat. So I reached down. I said, okay, everybody hold their breath. We both held our breath. I grabbed the coat. I had I yelled at him, open the door. He ripped the door open. I threw the coat in there. We both closed the door and then leaned against it panting. I had already learned by this point that he would mirror whatever I did. So I started to slow my breathing down and he followed me. His breath slowed down. We finally were calm. And by the time he had relaxed, 
I went and grabbed one of my husband's coats, put it on him, and we were able to get to the doctor's appointment. Earlier, earlier on in the disease, when we first brought him home, I would have never been able to figure that out. I also have talked to people that had other issues, like a, a woman I talked to recently had a, her husband was a military officer and he thought he was in Vietnam. And when they would be driving down the freeway in front of one of the military bases in our area, he would try to leap out of the car on the freeway, which was terrifying to her because she couldn't stop him and she'd have to whip the car over to the side of the road. So we talked about this. He thought he was back in Vietnam. So first of all, we made sure she had the, the child safety locks turned on in the car so he couldn't open the door without her helping him out. Then we had to go into his reality where his place of safety was. Every time he saw that base, he would suddenly be transported back. So we figured out So what we did is we discussed where did he think he was? If he thought he was supposed to be at the front, then have her tell him that one of his commanders radioed in and said that they were now doing mop up for this job, for this particular operation, and that they would get him an AAR on his desk once they completed the mop up. So when she did that for him, he was able to relax because he realized it was taken care of that his plan had worked and that things were going well and he could relax. It was just getting into his shoes so that he could be in a place of safety. So that's one way of working with something. Also, if you've got somebody that's in the family that uh, is accusing you of stealing things. Now, this was a big deal uh, for another family member I had where they were constantly losing stuff So what we ended up figuring out is I started buying extras of whatever it was that they were regularly losing. And so when instead of me arguing with them and saying you didn't uh, I didn't steal it, instead I said, "Tell me more about when who who took it? Did can you describe the person who took it? Did you see them take it? When was the last time you saw it? Let me help you search for it and see if we can find it." And Nine times out of 10, I could not find the item right away, but I would go and find whatever it was that was missing. Usually it was a favorite sweater. And I would bring that out and say, I found it and become the hero instead of the person that stole from them. And so it was really important to me to make sure that I brought them back to a place of safety and they knew they could rely on me. Now, I never had to deal with somebody accusing me of cheating on my spouse. Um, I haven't had that opportunity yet and I hope never to have that, but that is a problem for people. It's very common when you're doing spouse care to to have that issue. And it's gonna take a lot of support from your family and friends because it's very difficult when you have somebody that is screaming and yelling at you because they, they see some, you talking to somebody out in the yard or they see you uh, see someone in the yard that while you're in the house and they think that you're having a rendezvous. So you cannot argue them out of that. You're just gonna to have to find a way to uh, get yourself some downtime because they will not let go of that fear. Now. Here's something that might be easier. When you are going to bed at night, if they no longer recognize you, one of the things I recommend is that they will recognize your voice well into their dementia. If Even if they don't recognize you, tuck them into bed, turn off the light, say you're going to go out and take care of whatever thing you're going to take care of in the kitchen, wait five minutes, go back in, Wait five minutes, go back into the room, announce yourself that you're there, and then crawl into bed in the dark. And they will not be upset that you are not who they think you should be. They'll recognize your voice. So these are some of the tricks that I have listed in the book here. Um, also, resources. Now, not everybody knows where to go. And a lot of times when you get that first diagnosis and you don't know where to start, a great place to start is the website created by Lori LeBay and Dave Waiterich. It's called DementiaMap.com, all one word, DementiaMap. Um, they have 
global resources. They have free education. They have experts on their website that you can contact that can help you through difficult situations. And I strongly encourage you to take a look at that website because it's a great place to start because a lot of times you don't even know the words that the doctor just gave you. So they have a great glossary to explain terms that you don't understand. They also have resources to find support. So if you are looking for support, that's another spot that I would strongly recommend. And then I also want to talk about one of the first guests that I had on my show, Loretta Vaney. She is the Lego lady and she created fidget toys because when she was taking care of her mom, the way she was able to connect with her mom was through the use of Legos. Her mom would always come back to her when, at, wherever she was in her, when she would be sitting quietly and not interacting with anybody, she'd pull out the Legos and she'd ask her, well, how are you feeling today? Show me how you're feeling or what, do, let's play with the Legos. And she put them out and her mom would build something and she would immediately come to life and talk. Loretta mentioned that she was able to communicate and self-feed until two days before she passed through the use of Legos. So don't underestimate the use of play when you're taking care of somebody because fidget toys are a great way to calm somebody down, especially when they're sundowning. One of the things that I did with my dad when he was sundowning is I got him a special apron and it looked just like it was a barbecue apron, but It looked like the shop apron that we used when I, I was growing up. And so it was something that he recognized. And I would put stuff in the pockets of this apron so that he could play with them. We also would wear them at the dinner table so that he would not feel singled out because if he had a, an issue where he spilled down his front, we would all take off our aprons and then I could wash them after dinner. And it wasn't just him, it was all of us. So this is something where you want to be inclusive and make the person feel like they belong. It's another way to keep them from getting upset and withdrawing. And you can keep longer, uh, uh, basically you can keep your connections and still have time to have your, your relationship with that person. Anything you can do to empower them. Another thing that we had, uh, an issue with and I still groan when I think about this um, my father had a sweet tooth and he had what I would say was a boy howdy sweet tooth it was huge and he confused cough drops with candy and I could not figure out why he was flu-like symptoms and so I uh, we had an event that we were supposed to go to and my dad instead was feverish. He was really ill. We canceled everything. We stayed home with them. And then we discovered the stash of cough drops in his nightstand because the door was drawer was open. And so my husband and I, the next day uh, decided that it was time to take him shopping for sugar-free candies. And he got to pick out whatever he wanted, however many he wanted. And we waited a couple days and uh, uh, we we got all rid of all the cough drops in the house and then started letting him have the candy. And we also gave him some pocket money so he could go buy his own candy. And that was a big turning point for us until he started eating too much candy and we had to kind of shell it out to him. So what I did instead is I started putting nibbling snacks on the kitchen counter and I would have things that, you know, crackers and a little bit of you know fruit or vegetables whatever he was in the mood to eat I would have that out that way he wasn't putting things in his mouth that he shouldn't and also keeping his stomach full so that when he was eat, if he was eating too many sugar-free candies he didn't become ill another thing you might want to think about when we are first starting out it is so scary and so confusing um, is having your friends and family involved in what you're taking in your caretaking because not everybody's going to be on board at the same time uh, all of us as kids have different experiences and are raised differently than each other in the family and no two children are going to have the same experience with their parent so you can have a child that gets along great with their parents that they're taking care of and then you can have the the one that feels like they're the odd man out like they never fit in and they could argue with you about how to take care of your family member 
the best thing you can do is get everybody on board and get everybody information. It's really easy to be an armchair quarterback when you're 2,000 miles away and you're not seeing what's happening. If you can actually come and visit and be there for a week and experience what is going on with that family member so you don't think that your your sister or brother is lying or who your mom is lying to you. Or Now, with, with parents, they will cover for each other. So if you are take if your mom is taking care of your dad or your dad's taking care of your mom and asking them how and asking them how they're doing they're more than likely going to cover and say i'm fine this is another one that was a big eye opener for my family we had no clue how exhausted my dad was taking care of my mom even though we had gotten a home health aide to come in and spend a few hours with her every single day to give my dad some respite. By that time, he was so far over the bend that we didn't recognize it and we didn't know he was self-medicating on aspirin, which is another problem. There are so many signs that we had no idea what they were without actually being present in the home because if they would rise to the occasion and we would go and sit down with them. And then until my mom got too ill and was bedridden, we didn't know what was really going on. And by that time, it was too late. If we had known sooner, but how do you know sooner? I mean, it it's, takes time to visit them, spend time with them, find out what's really going on. Are they able to pay their bills? Are they able to drive? We found we found when I visited my father that he had sheared off both side view mirrors on his car. We found that he had also not changed the oil in his car for two full years and the motor was about to seize. So it it's not about being nosy. It's just learning to be a detective to see if things are going well. And if they have papers that are stacking up all over the house, that might be a sign that there's a problem going on. It's learning how to spot the signs the and the signals telling you that they are not able to handle stuff. If you see pill containers that are scattered all over the place. If you see things like um, they're telling you one thing and doing something else, that it could be that that's another sign that something else is going on. If they don't want to go out and socialize anymore, that's where they used to be very, very gregarious. That's another symptom to watch for that they might be having an issue and you need to step in and start helping. Now, don't take over. If you don't want to have resistance with your family, huge arguments and pushbacks, especially with your loved ones, it's offering help, suggesting help, showing ways to help, not saying, you can't do this anymore. I'm going to take care. So instead of telling them they can't do it anymore, offer help, figure out ways that you can help. Perhaps they have a best friend or a sibling that can come in and say, hey, it looks like you're having some trouble with this. Can I help you? Figure out ways that you can work with them so that they're not resisting the help that they need. Uh, this is one of the biggest problems we had with my family is that they, they, this is why we kept getting the I'm fine answer. They didn't want to admit that they were having a problem because they had always been the head of the family. And it was a very, very difficult role reversal for them. It is not easy for any of us to do this. And it's there's an emotional component. Think about if you have lost someone close to you, how difficult it is when you are grieving for that person. It, they're grieving for the loss of who they used to be, and they can't quite figure out why. They may not know why they can't do these things anymore. They might not understand why they're losing things, or they think somebody's stealing from them, or or they're embarrassed because they are used to being in charge. If you can figure out a way to create dignity in approaching them, you will have a much easier chance of working with them. Also. Ask them how they want to have help. You'd be surprising how often they'll just say, I need help here. But if you don't ask, how do you know? And I had to learn that the hard way too. So there's several different ways that we can do this. But going back to the book, what I did here is I was looking for a way to help other people 
find the things I couldn't find. And so I wanted to make sure that people like me who are page fanners, who are like, I can, I know what's in here. I can find it quickly. I've got to look someplace and I couldn't find it. I just made sure that I put in text boxes and I'm just, I apologize that my green screen is just not helping today, but um, I put in text boxes so you can flip through and see what's covered in the chapter. And then because I am who I, A I also put in here a cookbook so that others could find, uh, well, okay, let's just be blunt. Not everyone wants to see a dementia book in their home. If you don't want to see a dementia book in your home, but you, but the if, you're, if your loved one doesn't want to see a dementia book in your home, but you need to read it, then what I did is I included a cookbook in chapter 13. I ended up putting a, a tab on one of my books in there and then I put a brown paper bag cover over it and you can write anything you want on there that your loved one won't want to read. Maybe it's dinners for beginners, maybe it's knitting 101, maybe it's uh, the best way to clean a carburetor. Whatever it is that you don't want, that your loved one would not want to look at, you can put that on there and then you can read it and if they come over your shoulder and want to know what you're looking at, you can flip to that tap page in chapter 13 and say, what do you want for dinner? Pick something out because in here also is a course on how to cook. So chapter 13 is also designed. So if you were not the cook in the family, it has every step you need to take laid out so that you can actually cook the recipes in there. There are things uh, to know what to shop for. So I have a shopping list included, uh, how long that should last for those groceries, how many uh, portions it will cook. Uh, usually it's a meal for two. Uh, and if it's more than a meal for two, it'll say what you can set aside for portions. And then at the very back of the chapter also discusses not using bibs, how to grind food when they can no longer chew, and also discusses uh, eating at the table because people will stop being able to use utensils. They'll no longer be able to manage and manipulate the tools. It is okay for them to self-feed with using their hands. So allow them to be able to do the skills that they have. Don't keep correcting them because you want to have the downtime, you want to have the respite, and the more you can keep them active in their own self-care, the less you have to. So in addition to that, I've also got in here over 130 resources because I know how desperately we need resources. If you are caring for a spouse, then I highly recommend you look at wellspouse.org. They have telephone and online uh, groups for caring for somebody who is seriously ill. And if you're caring for a spouse that's seriously ill, then you want to take a, take a look at their services because you can call them if you can't get a break and leave the house for a regular support group. Um, also check the Alzheimer's Association for uh, local resources for support groups because uh, right now I just want to tell you when you are not caring for yourself you are going to probably pass before your loved one you want to take care of yourself you want to build in time downtime because if you don't do that for yourself you are going to burn out and you won't be able to give the quality care and you're going to start making mistakes that you wouldn't have made if you'd given yourself time for rest Self-care is not selfishness. It means that you become a better caregiver and you will carry less of the guilt that comes with dementia care. Because trust me, there is so much guilt that is built in with caregiving. You're constantly second guessing yourself. Are you doing the right thing? I should have done this differently. Oh my God, I did this. Now we're having a meltdown. There, it, It's like having a Louisville Slugger baseball bat chasing you around the house all day saying you did this wrong kapow. You, you just need to have time to give yourself, even if it's five, 10 minutes just to go for a walk, do not feel guilty about taking care of yourself. Another thing that I really strongly recommend to people is 
the program Share the Care. It's about group caregiving, and I do talk about it in the group in the book. Um, Sheila Warnock and Kathy Capicella put this program together. It is a fantastic program, and I'm really hoping to get Sheila on the show. She put together uh, step-by-step instructions. step-by-step instructions on how to form a caregiving group with family, friends, coworkers, church members, whoever wants to participate. Everyone's time is valuable. There are, even if it's just to come over and deliver a dinner or spend some time talking to somebody uh, or taking them out for a drive, whatever it is that you can do to help. The system itself is set up so that if you have a minimum of eight people doing care. You have two captains for the week who help organize everything, and then they can focus on you and your loved one. And so for that week, they'll manage doctor's appointments, transportation, making sure you've got your groceries, whatever help that you need as the diseases progress. And then you're only volunteering for two weeks and or for a week, and then the next group takes over. It's very organized. They have a information on how to put together a caregiving manual so that when you're doing a handoff, all the information is right there. And and they can pass it off to you so that you know exactly what's going on. Uh, Also, it it just is wonderful and building a bond that is so strong that after your loved one passes, you have a group together that you've gone through so much that you can always rely on each other. So you'll never be alone. Now, another thing that I really like to talk about and and don't talk about this very often is when you are trying, forgive me, my brain just went blank. It's early in the morning here. Um, When you are trying to uh, figure out how to do these things, a lot of times you're going to feel alone and isolated. Uh, Give yourself permission to laugh with your loved one. Laughter is the most powerful tool in your toolbox. Used correctly, you can uh, reduce the stresses between you and your family member by a significant amount. If you, if they're asking you the same question over and over and over to the point where you're ready to scream, to the point where you're ready to scream, instead of losing it, let's reframe this. Let's look at this from a different direction. One of the things that we can do is they'll ask you that question the first time and then just laugh with them and say, oh, it's 11 o'clock if they've asked you what time it is. And then they'll laugh too. You want to encourage them to join you in this, but then we're also going to include cueing aids with this. So one of the things that I recommend is either using a whiteboard or perhaps a notepad. Um, I used to do this in the car with my dad all the time where he'd ask me where we're going. The first time I would tell him, the second time he would ask, we would laugh together and I'd tell him again. The third time I'd say, oh, uh, could you, I asked him to hold this notepad for me. Can you read what's on the notepad for me? I can't remember. And he'll read it. He got his own answer. And He stopped asking me the same question after two or three times he would read it and he'd be able to find his own answer. So you can use this in your own home where you can ask them to that you need your help, have them hold that for you while you're doing something else so that when they start asking that question over and over again, you can just point them to that page. They'll read it, have their own answer They're That's what they're looking for. They're looking for they're lost and they're looking for that answer. So anything you can do to empower them, then they'll stop asking that question because it's a met need at that point. So it's a met need at that point. So anything you can do to empower them to give you downtime is wonderful. I also want to recommend memory cafes. If you're not familiar with memory cafes, these are available all over the country. They are group uh, caregiving activities so that you and your loved one go and, and join for an activity, whether it's story time, painting, just talking to people and, and forming friends. Um, it could be they're playing with Legos, for example. It could also be that you have guest speakers coming in talking about topics that you might not be aware of to help you learn more about dementia care. 
So I would strongly encourage you to see if you've got mem a memory cafe in your area. It's a great way to end up talking to other people who've gone through the same thing that you have or are going through and you can share information. And it's also very empowering because at that point, you realize you are not alone because the care because care is so isolating and you just don't realize that there are so many other people out there with you and that you can connect with and you never know who you're going to meet that could make a difference for you with just one simple story or they're telling you something on how they failed and how they got through it that could be the key to helping you so consider memory cafes. Uh, I strongly encourage you to do that. It's a way to get out of the house. It's a way to do an activity. Maybe you get to paint, maybe you do story time. Whatever it is, you need the socialization as much as your loved one does. Now, we are getting close to the end of time here. So, and it looks like Les will not be joining us today. Um, I have a couple other things to talk about here, which one is wandering, which I think might take us to the end here. Um, my father was an enormous escape artist. And one of the things that he did before he moved in with us, he had got caught in the system and he was uh, not released to our care. And we had to fight to get him out. And during that time, he knew He knew he didn't belong, and so he would escape from the facilities. And so then they would, uh, after five escapes, they would send him to the next more secure facility. And he was, even though he had moderate dementia, he still had enough of the skills left from his job that he was able to figure out how to escape from each of these places. The last place he was in uh, was the most secure facility in our area. He saw that there was a problem with the plate glass window in his room and he waited until his roommate was taken to physical therapy and he stayed in his pajamas and slippers so nobody would figure out that he was going to escape. He unscrewed the plate glass windows, moved, took it out, climbed out the window, put it back in and screwed it in properly and then went for a walk and they didn't discover he was gone for another 30 minutes. Um, and and then 30 minutes later, 911 started getting calls that there was an elderly gentleman in pajamas and slippers crossing against the light uh, on a main highway. So uh, in order to prevent that, you have to understand what is causing the problems where he, they're eloping or wandering, escaping, whatever you want to call it. Um, figure out what the triggers are so you can prevent it on my website under the resources page under useful forms, I have the meltdown trigger list. You can use that to identify your loved one's triggers so that you can figure out how to prevent them from wandering out of there. Another thing you want to think about, like colors, to prevent them from walking out without you being present. I discovered that a black doormat looks like a hole. And my dad, without being told, would turn around and walk away from that door instead of going out the door. And I discovered this by accident because he and my husband would be outside gardening. They'd come in, track mud all over the floor, and I was getting tired of cleaning the floor every few minutes. So I put a couple of doormats, one inside, one outside. My husband wiped his feet, walked in. My husband my uh, and turned around to look at my dad. My dad turned around and wandered off and came in through the garage. It was like, okay, what's going on here? And we figured out that black was the hole. So it's really easy to put a black doormat in front of the door, any exit door. You can also put shower curtains over a door or drapes so that they don't recognize that that's a door. Now, of course, that didn't necessarily work with my father, but it would work for most ordinary mortals. Another thing to think about is you can literally put a dowel in a window or you can put a window lock uh, because it's too complicated for them to find. And we want to take advantage of tunnel vision. Um, tunnel vision is something that comes along with the dementia where they're just going to be mono doorknob. And so you can move a doorknob and replace it with a an active handle and put the active handle at the top or bottom of the door. Once you do that, then they're going to walk up to the door, try to get out. They're going to reach for the handle to turn it. It doesn't move. They'll turn around and go try someplace else, giving you time to stop them before they go and redirect them. So 
we are just about out of time. I want to thank you for hanging on there with me. And, and I want to let you know that we will be back on December 19th. And our guest will be Beth Marie Fahey. Beth Marie is a dementia caregiving survivor and blogger. She will share with us the importance of life after death of a loved one with dementia. In the meantime, you can go over to our YouTube channel at USA Global TV and Radio and look for the Dementia Home Care playlist where you'll find all of our past episodes. See you next time.